again. So we start our reading this morning in the Gospel of John chapter 2. And we'll be looking at chapter 2 from verse 13 to verse 22. And if you would read along with me this morning, it reads as follows. And the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, what sign do you show us, seeing that you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews therefore said, It took forty years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Our Father and our God, we glorify you this morning. We thank you, O God, to whom all honor and glory is due. As we go through your word this morning, I pray that your word would be impressed upon our hearts, that we would see the wonderful works of our risen Lord and Savior and prove ourselves doers of the word and not merely hear us. We give you glory and praise. Keep us this day in Christ's name. Amen. So we see here something very interesting taking place where our Savior uh, uh, is, this happened right after that first miracle in Canaan. Remember when Jesus turned the water into wine? So, so now um, Jesus was going uh, up and he's coming to Jerusalem and this is during the time of the Passover. And so we know that this is around the month of Nicene, which is April. This is the first uh, month in the Jewish calendar year. Um, going back to Exodus 12, where he told them to always uh, remember the Passover. And then he made it as a memorial. And then that's when he designed their, their calendar year, starting off with the Passover, which is the time of unleavened. And so now Jesus is about to go to Jerusalem to celebrate this. Now, mind you, he had just uh, came from turning water into wine, his very first miracle. And so something is happening now where Jesus is going to celebrate the Passover and he goes into the temple. And when he enters the temple, he sees something that utterly disturbs him. He sees something that utterly disturbs him. And so as we continue on in this series, let me tell you about a man. I think we all figured out now the man who I'm speaking about is none other than Jesus himself. And so let me tell you something about Jesus. And we see this right here as he is going into uh, uh, the temple to celebrate Passover. And so we see he's going in and he's going to cleanse the temple. Now this is very significant because I'm going to come back to this at the end, right? He's, he's cleansing the temple. And why would he be cleansing the temple? He's seeking to purify that which belongs to God. Notice when he went into the temple, something very interesting was taking place. And so we're going to see Jesus' priority, his prophecy, and his power. Through these several verses, we will see his priority, his prophecy, and his power. Because when Jesus went into the temple, it says, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated in their tables. Sorry, they were seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the money which the money changers had, and he overturned the tables. And so Jesus went into the temple and he's expecting to see temple service going on. But instead, he found men doing business. And the business that they were doing was not the business of God. Because inside the temple, um, on the outer skirts of the temple was something what they would call the, 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 the court of the Gentiles or the, the Gentile court. 
And so on this outer layer where the Gentiles would be, then there was an inner layer where the women and the children would be, uh, the Jewish women and children. And then in there, um, after you pass that area where the women and children would be, then the Jewish man would be in a certain place. And then when you go into the holy place and you have the priests, then you have the high priest and so on and so forth. And so Gentiles could come and worship God in the temple, but they had to be on the outer skirts of the temple. So here they had money changes set up on the outer skirts of the temple. And what they were doing, they were basically, the, the temple had its own currency. And so when individuals came in, they had to exchange whatever currency they had for the temple currency in order to do worship. So the guys in the temple, they were uh, basically having a, a, a taxation issue. I know you all know about taxes. We have to pay taxes and we you know, pay a lot of taxes, especially school districts, right? We pay a lot of taxes. And so we see here, when the Gentiles came in, the Jewish men or the priests who were there, they were taking the money, they were charging them more than it would actually cost to pay for a dove or a goat or whatever they would need to do the sacrifices, and they were making a profit off of it. So they were actually profiting from people coming in to worship God. Now, mind you, when Jesus walked into the temple, he said, well, wait a minute, how can you guys who are supposed to be taking care of the temple be making a profit from the temple? Why do we have money changes in here? Why is there taxation? Why, why would an individual need to pay this exuberant price to get a bull or a goat or a sheep to give a sacrifice? Now, mind you, we see a lot of this today. We see a lot of this in the so-called evangelical arena where pastors, preachers, teachers, guys, um, um, man, leaders like myself, are uh, uh, um, basically uh, pimping out the pulpit. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Where they are literally um, um, exploiting people for finances and using these finances to build mansions and fly around the world in their jets and call it all, well, this is for the sake of the gospel. But they're not carrying the sick on those jets and they're not taking care of the needy on those jets. It's for their comfort, but I'm not even going to go there. These guys were in the temple of God, and in the temple of God, they were um, exchanging and selling goods for worship. And so when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus did not like that. And Jesus walked in and he kicked over the tables and he turned over everything and notice what he says. He says, and to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. So these men turn around and made the house of God, made the dwelling place of God, they turned it into a business. And Jesus said, no, that can't be. You cannot make my father's house a business office. You cannot make my father's house someplace where you sell, watch this, worship. Because that's basically what they were doing. They were selling worship. And we need to be very careful, especially with our gospel music, especially with our leaders, our pastors, and so forth, um, how we charge people for something that God said is free, right? Walking into the place of worship, and people feel like they have to pay to walk into the place of worship. Um, that's why the Bible says that God loves the cheerful giver, the one who gives freely, because when someone gives under compulsion, that is often manipulation, and God did not call us to do that. But here, Jesus walked into the temple. He see these folks um, um, exchanging goods, that, that, that doing a, job, a service that they were not supposed to be doing, and it frustrated him. And Jesus got frustrated to the point where he kicked over the temple, uh, sorry, kicked over the tables in the temple. And we saw his priority. What was Jesus' priority? He says, he, watch this, his priority had to do with his father's house. And that is why he got so upset. Notice what he said. He said, and to those who were selling the doves, take these things away for this is my father's house. Right? Now, mind you, Jesus is saying that because his priority was the will of God. His priority was the will of the father. And when he came to this earth, he had no other objective other than to fulfill the will of the Father. Now, this is very important because I believe this is him directly speaking to us today. We are supposed to be, as believers, busy about doing the Father's business, just as our Savior had been. Now, Jesus was all about the Father's business, and he called us to do the same, that we should be all about our Father's business. And here we see Christ himself. He made his priority the will of the Father. Now watch what he says. His disciples remembered that it was written, 
zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us that you have authority to do these things? Now, isn't that just like man, right? Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus is showing them, listen, this is my father's house. You should have respect for my father's house. Now, mind you, God was their father as well, right? The Hebrews, the, the Jews, the Israelites. And they know they, well, they were supposed to have known God as father. And they know that what they were doing was not supposed to be done in the temple. Remember when we go to the book of Malachi, we see in Malachi chapter 1 and 2, how the um, um, those who were giving sacrifices during the time, they were bringing um, crippled and decrepit animals to God, and God called them out. He says, listen, you wouldn't give these things to your governors and, and your princes, but yet still you are giving God the sick and the lame, meaning a sacrifice that was not worthy of him. And here we find, um, more than 400 years later, individuals in the temple still doing, in essence, the same thing, but now they're selling the goods. And so Jesus comes on the scene. He said, this is not the will of my father. The will of my father is that we would worship him, right? But here these guys were exploiting the temple of God, and Jesus had to literally go in to demonstrate to them that this was wrong. And then he says something profound, mind you. They asked him, they said, what authority do you have to say these things? Notice what Jesus said. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. Well, what does that have to do with the question that they ask? Well, Jesus here was prophesying. So we saw Jesus' priority. His priority was about the Father's business. That's why he drove them out. Now he's giving a prophecy to them, not even answering their question because they ask him what authority does he have and he's showing them, he's going to prophesy to them, but watch what he's going to prophesy about. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. And so they ask, well, wait a minute, it took 40 years for, for our fathers to build this temple. How can you now destroy it and rebuild it in three days? That's impossible. Well, see, when Jesus was speaking to them, he was prophesying about himself, and they truly didn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus went on to explain to them clearly what he was saying. Watch his words. Jesus says, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews then said, it took 40 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. Now notice what Jesus is saying. He's speaking about his power. He's speaking about his power to give his life away and to raise it back up again. He's speaking about his power over life and death. He's speaking about his power that has been uh, granted him because he is the God-man. Now notice, Jesus showed us his priority. His priority was to do the will of the Father. This is my Father's house. That's why he drove them out. Then he, then he prophesied about himself. He says, listen, um, I will die and be risen in three days. And by giving them that prophecy, he's showing them his power. Because no one has the power to raise life or to bring something back to life. No one has the power to bring the dead back to life. But yet Jesus is saying, destroy this temple and in three days I would raise it up again. So we saw Jesus's, watch this, we saw his um, um, priority, his, his prophecy, and now we're seeing his power. What's his priority? His priority is to do the will of the Father. What's his prophecy? His prophecy is that he would give his life and raise it up again. What's the power? He have the power to raise his life up again. And so they was asking him what authority he had. And he was showing them, well, I have all authority because I am God. And he's literally showing them this, but they couldn't understand it. But the main point that I want everyone to get today is this. Jesus, when he walked into the temple, he saw that they were doing things that was not of the will of God. Now, mind you, I want you to have a look at this. I want you to understand clearly what I'm saying right now. When Jesus walked into the temple, he saw them not honoring the Father. So he drove them out. Mind you, that's what a strong man does. He drove them out. He demonstrated his authority and his power by driving them out. And then he said, destroy this body, I would raise it up in three days. Now he's showing them, he, he, he prophesied about his power to bring death to life, right? 
but his root thing was the temple of God. What, what he was speaking about was the temple of God because then he said in verse 21, right? He made sure they understood clearly what he was saying. He says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body so that when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this and they believed the scriptures and the word which he has spoken. So mind you, it was after Jesus, uh, it was after Jesus rose from the dead that his disciples remembered <laughs> what he said and then they understood and then they believed the scriptures that were spoken. And it's so interesting that as, as we go throughout the Gospels, we would see that the disciples were saying, we believe, we believe, we believe. But then apparently they didn't have a full belief because uh, they sort of kind of believed. But was it truly a saving faith, a saving belief? Because we see after the fact, John would keep um, uh, making these points that, oh, it was after his resurrection that they believed. It was, acts, it was after he came back from the dead that they understood. It was after... Everything was after the resurrection that the disciples' eyes were open and they now truly came to this knowledge of God that they didn't have before. Now, mind you, his resurrection did that. But I want to go back to this main point, what he, what he was speaking about with the temple. He says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Now, mind you, remember, he walked into the temple and he drove out the money changes. And then he said, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it, speaking of his body. Saints, I believe, and I know for a fact, that Christ, when he was speaking about this, was speaking to us in regards to our temples as well. Mind you, Christ went into a physical temple and drove people out. And he showed them that this is the Lord's house. This is the temple of God. And then he says, I will raise this temple in three days, speaking of his body. Now, mind you, here's what I want you to realize. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, he says, do you not know? that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And speaking of that, Paul was speaking in regards to the church. He's saying that the church, we are the temple of God collectively. But he comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, and he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, therefore Glorify God in your body. So Paul is literally saying that our bodies, our physical bodies are the temple of God. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 16, he says, Or oh, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Speaking of the physical body. For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God says, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Listen, saints, to what I'm saying right now. The temple that Christ wants to come in today and cleanse is your heart. The temple that Christ wants to come in today and cleanse is your mind. And just how we came into that place with the money changers, just how we came into that place where they were doing things in the house of God that was not supposed to be done, it's the same thing that's taking place in our minds today because our minds have been so polluted as Christians that we believe that we're worshiping God, but we have a form of godliness and we are denying His power, the power thereof. And Jesus wants to come in and cleanse. He sent His Holy Spirit, His Comforter. He said, I will not leave you as orphans but I will send you a comforter and he would abide in you and the reason why we have Christians with depression and Christians who are being oppressed is because it's in the mind the reason why we have all of these things going on within the body of Christ where the church is starting to look like the world and it looks like we're falling into this apostate belief this, this this apostate walk is because the people of God are walking away from the things of God and just how Jesus came into that temple and just how he cleansed that temple and turned over the tables he wants to turn over those thoughts in your life just how he turned over the money changes he wants to run out those immoral things in your life just how he drove those people out of the temple he wants to drive those bad thoughts out of your life why because how whatsoever a man think it so is he and the scripture clearly says that we're supposed to worship God with the renewing of our minds and something has happened in the mind of believers that Christ is not at the center anymore just how these men we're in the temple exchanging money and doing things that were not of God. So we as believers have things going on in our minds that are not supposed to be in the temple of God because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he has called us to live in such a way to bring glory to his name. 
by how we live in these earthen temples. And saints, I am telling you this this morning, I'm telling you this today, that Jesus, his desire is that he would have priority in your heart. He's given a prophetic word. You are his temple and he is giving you the power because when you die, you will raise from the dead to be with him in eternal glory. He's prophesied that over all who believes in him. And then he comes and he shows us his power because he's coming back with all power and all might. And he's coming back for you. He's coming back for everyone who believed that he died for their sins and with power and authority rose from the dead. And this is why he walked into that temple and cleansed it because it was the temple of God. And this is why he wants to walk into your life and purify and cleanse it because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And he's called you to this particular service to honor him, to use your body, to bring glory to him. As Paul says that the Holy Spirit, our bodies is a possession of the Holy Spirit. Christ paid a price for us. Therefore, glorify God with your body. And that is what he's calling us to do today. So when Jesus walked into that temple, when he saw those money changes, it, it perturbed him and he got upset. Just in the same way right now, when the Holy Spirit sees what's taking place in our mind he is grieved and we are quenching him and god wants to do the same thing in our minds to eradicate the things that are not of him to turn over the things that are not of him to kick out the things that are not of him and everything that is of god those are the things that's supposed to be in your mind and this is where he has us to be and so saints i believe this day that god he has us to always remember christ himself he wants us to remember this. Our bodies are the temple of God. And we are called to honor God with our bodies. Will you do that today? Will you honor God with your mind? Will you honor God with your life? Will you honor God in your heart? There may be someone listening to me right now. You've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to invite you to do that even right now. The scripture says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ... He's the son of God, that he died for your sins. Now, you may not fully comprehend this deity, but if you believe that Christ came and died for your sins because you are a sinner, we, are all, we have all fallen short. We are all guilty. But when we place our faith and trust in Christ, not based on our works, but based on what he has done, if you believe that he died for your sins and rose from the dead, the scripture says you are saved, not because of something you did, but because all that Christ has already done. He's done it all for us. He's given his life. He raised it back up from the dead. And just as he is, we will be also. And so if you believe that today, you are saved. Let me pray with you right now. Father God, I thank you for those listening right now, for that person who before um, did not trust in Christ for the pardon of their sins, but now they've come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Father, I thank you for this person. I thank you for all of them right now listening to the sound of my voice. I thank you for your spirit who has led them into your truth. May you guide our hearts and mind to your glory. For these things, we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. I pray that the word of God today has richly been impressed upon your heart and that you would be blessed as you go throughout this day. Now, um, stay tuned. We have a few announcements that we want to share with you before um, our service concludes. Amen. Be blessed.